Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to the 92nd live episode of Ask Abhijit. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. And uh, as you know, today is a live video chat session. So I will be sharing the link very soon. Before I do that, let me just uh, remind you all, just in case, that uh, I have created a new short clips channel in which you will, uh, in which all the new short clips will be going. So the link for that is in the description. This is also, you can see it on the screen, youtube.com slash Abhijit Chavda Clips. Okay, so uh, with that said, let me share the link for joining the video chat. Uh, and before I do that again, there are very simple rules. One question per person, please. The topic must be the Russia-Ukraine uh, geopolitics. And please keep your question short and precise. And... Uh, let me share the link. Should be able to see it now. Let's do it. Let me pin it up. Yes, it is pinned now. So, so you should be able to see that. So I'll wait for the people to join. And today I'm, I'm going to make one small change. So I will take the question. And then after I take the question, I will be the only person on the screen. That, day, that way I think we will be able to keep things moving faster than uh, in in previous episodes so i can see people joining now so let's uh, get get somebody in i think people are still settling down so let's bring in mr uh, adarsh so i can see people joining now yes, sir. so let's uh, get get somebody in uh, can you please uh, uh, mute down. that whatever it is so let's bring in Mr. Uh, oh, Adarsh. sorry, sorry, sir, sorry, sir. Yes, sir. So let's. Uh, yes, sir. Where are you from? Uh, sir, I am from Kanpur. And what's your name? Adarsh, is it? Yes, sir. Sir, okay, I have great. a question. Nice to meet you. Yes. Regarding, uh, which is not uh, directly linked to Ukraine and uh, uh, Russia conflict. The topic um, is the Russia-Ukraine Russia conflict only. Sir, that I have is been what trying have to ask this question uh, from you for, for, from many times, since many days. But you have never picked one. That why India doesn't invest uh, 25 to $30 billion per year on research, especially in military research work. Yeah, it, it, okay. Okay, let me answer it in brief. Uh, I think India should spend more in research and development. Yeah. And sir, thanks. Right, nice sir. to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you. Let's bring in somebody else. And please keep the topic of your question related to the subject at hand. I, that's my request. Uh, let's bring in Mr. Himanshu. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Hi. Where are you from, sir? I'm from uh, Jaipur, Rajasthan. Nice to meet you, sir. What's your question? So my question is... Uh... Regarding the news that is being uh, shown uh, for this Russia and Ukraine conflict, like for example, uh, the uh, the Crimea, which was annexed by Russia in 2014, uh, is dependent on Ukraine for water supplies. But Ukraine has stopped its water supply. But uh, and this all this is also a reason uh, to provoke. I mean, uh, Russia can be provoked with this, as there is no water supply in Ukraine uh, Crimea. But this news is nowhere in this uh, media. And I don't know how much they can they control the media and even in Indian media also. Yes. So, uh, so what's the question? Basic question is, uh, uh, who controls Indian media majorly? Even <laughs> they do not show these types of news. And not a single point from the Russia side. Okay, I get it. Good question, sir. I'm going to put you off the screen now. Okay, so thank you and a very good question. Uh, so the question is, why? who controls the Indian media? That is the question. And why is none of this being reported in the Indian media and in the world media? So it's, it's true. What Himanshu just said is absolutely right. What's happened since 2014 after the Russian annexation of the Crimea peninsula what's happened is that the ukrainians have stopped the uh, there was a i think there was a river or a big canal that used to supply water to the crimean peninsula from ukraine and the ukrainians cut that off uh, that supply off they built a dam to uh, 
prevent this water going into the Crimean Peninsula. And that essentially dried out the entire thing. And uh, the Western media has never reported this and neither has the Indian media. So that's what we are seeing all the time, that the reporting that is happening in the media, whether it's the Western media or the Indian media, it is not free and fair. It is not unbal- It is not balanced. It is not objective. It's not accurate. They are only showing some si- a certain side of the story. And that brings us to the question which Himanshu asked, that who controls the media? Who controls the Indian media? Who controls the Western media? Now, in the case of the Western media, let's say the BBC or the or CNN or Washington Post or New York Times or whatever it is, the Guardian, they are all controlled. They essentially act as propaganda arms of their governments. That's what it is. And of course, there is funding that comes in from China as well. So they are very much pro-China as well. So to understand who controls the media, you have to look into who is funding, who owns these media companies and who are the shareholders and all that. If you look into that, just follow the money and then you will understand uh, why the news coverage is the way it is. Now, in the case of the Indian media, I have said this yesterday as well, last week also, that there are two, three channels in India Indian media channels that are covering the Ukraine uh, conflict and they are covering it from the NATO perspective or the US perspective. I I don't mean to say that they should cover it from a Russian perspective. I mean to say that they should cover it from an Indian perspective. What is the Indian national interest in all of this? Right? What's best for India? They don't tell you that. They simply tell you the US perspective or the NATO perspective. So the reporting even in the India, Indian media is not fair. It's not balanced. It's not objective. So, and and I I don't know who's. I mean, I have not done the investigation myself as to who controls them, who is funding them, who owns them. I'm sure all of you can do it. I'm sure most of the information is available somewhere or the other in the public domain. So, just follow the money, and you will get your answer, right? But it's clear that the reporting is not fair. It's not balanced. It's not objective, and it's it's. Uh, not in line with the Indian national interest. So that's what I can say. Himan Shuji, uh, thank you very much. Very good question. Nice meeting you. All right. Uh, let's bring in somebody else. Let's bring in... Uh, I'm not sure what his name is. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Hi, what's Hello. your name, sir? Where are you from? Atharva Malu, sir, from Ambad. Maharashtra. Nice, nice to meet you, sir. What's your question? So my question is: uh, In the Russia-Ukraine conflict, can India lead an alliance like G7, BRI, NATO to uh, to carry on negotiations with any country uh, which are uh, responsible or war countries uh, which are fought, uh, fighting with each other uh, and uh, take uh, decisions on world affairs and etc. Things by forming an organization like this, big organizations. Okay, good question, sir. Uh, I will answer it. I'm going to remove you from the screen while answering. So the question uh, he has asked is, should or can India form a multinational organization that uh, does negotiations and uh, solves geopolitical issues and conflicts and all that? The question is, I'm sure India can do it. The question, the real question is, what does India gain from that? If you See, from at, at the international level, whatever you do should be from the perspective of your own national interest. Now, let's say you want to play a big shot and you want to go and negotiate and solve conflicts and solve problems and all. The question is, you're going to spend a lot of time and effort, and maybe money doing all this. What do you get in return for, for this? Right. And if you go and negotiate and try to solve uh, problems, will people listen to you? So these are the questions. These are practical questions you have to ask yourself. We have a limited diplomatic core. Our government has limited time and money and all that. And the only sole objective of the government is to further India's national interest. Now, if you have X amount of hours per year and X amount of money per year to do this, would you like to spend some of that time and money solving the world's problems when your job is to solve the problems of the country? So that's the Uh, uh, That's the question we have to ask ourselves and that's why it's not practical for India 
to go uh, go around solving the world's problems creating an alliance or, or organization and all that unless it actually benefits india so it's a question of being absolutely practical so i'm sure india can do it but question is what does india gain in return so um, as of now there's uh, as we as we know there are some negotiations happening in ukraine uh, i think today the israeli prime minister went to ukraine or he i think he went to moscow and he and he spoke and he spoke with uh, with with president putin and uh, he's trying to try to trying to negotiate some sort of agreement or some sort of thing like that because there are lots of jewish people who live in ukraine and lots of jewish people who live in in the U- in in russia as well i think at least 20% of israel's population is can speak russian so that's why that country israel has a clear uh, is is a is in a way a stakeholder in what's happening there so as long as there is some national interest so something that furthers your national interest there's no point doing this so that's what i can say uh, so yeah a good question and let's bring in somebody else let's bring in uh, shikhar saraf hello 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 sir good evening good evening sir good evening where sir are where are you from could you could you, could you, could you, mute, could you that? mute that um, is it the fan noise i guess uh, no it's my no, voice it's echoing. my voice echoing okay uh, okay sir oh, where, okay, where, sir, are, you where, where are you from i am from mezapur You all right and what's the right, question, what's question shikhar sir i have two questions you can choose which one one one, only, one, please, one. only please one okay okay so my question is that why are the ukrainian officials uh, const- repeatedly other than any leader insisting pm modi to convince russia to stop the invasion uh, could you repeat uh, that could you repeat that please i didn't get it so why are the ukrainian officials repeatedly insisting pm modi other than any leader to convince russia to stop the invasion okay oh, i got it okay. i uh, got thank it you uh, thank I'm you gonna... for the question thank you for the question thank you sir i'm going to yeah okay because it's uh, echoing all the time so uh, the question is why are the ukrainian leaders insisting that pm modi should uh, resolve the problem and negotiate or something uh as far as i know i have not heard in ukrainian leader politician etc insist that prime minister modi should go and negotiate and resolve the problem i have not heard any such news what's happening what we are seeing is that the western nations the english speaking nations especially the us and uh, the uk and various other countries essentially the nato countries there uh they are they have launched a kind kind of a campaign on social media in which they are blaming india for abstaining in the un security council votes against russia so they insist that india needs to uh, india should have uh, voted against russia and that's a huge stain on india's character apparently so india is now no longer a democracy in india supports fascism and evil and, and uh, violence and all that even though china has done the same thing and they're not speaking a word against china so that's what's happening uh, the ukrainians have not been insisting that 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 the, our prime minister pm modi should get involved in this as far as i've heard i've not heard, heard any such thing and i have been following this quite uh, quite intently what's happening so shikhar good question that's that's what i can tell you all right thank you a uh, good question nice meeting you okay let's bring in uh, whom shall i bring in let's bring in mr shrey hello sir no no sir sir can you hear my voice yes i can hear you where are you from sir sir am i sir i'm actually i'm from i'm from delhi but i'm in south right now you where uh, i'm actually from chennai chennai right now okay okay great chennai, chennai. yes sir what's your question Sir, my question is: uh, oh, Even though uh, countries like Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan, and uh, Tajikistan were uh, Kazakhstan, all are separated from Soviet Union, but uh, still most of them are. Uh, I mean, they are still supporting Russia. Even 
my friend visited this country he said that people still prefer russia over many other may compared to us sir why is it uh, they are still supportive of russia and uh, even oh. in this war some but they are separ- I mean some but they are supporting russia only sir uh, okay why after separating they are still with the uh, soviet country so that's what i want to ask okay okay I, you, i get it thank you a good question nice meeting you i'm going to answer it now so uh, what shrey said is why are these republics the former ussr republics who are now no longer part of that country like tajikistan kazakhstan uzbekistan azerbaijan etc why do they still support uh russia and in in geo in geopolitical matters in things like the ukraine conflict etc why do they support the russians uh that's a very good question so there are multiple reasons for that first of all they are still very much under the russian sphere of influence uh russia is a very powerful nation and even though these countries are now no longer part of uh no longer part of the ussr the ussr broke up and but yet they are still very much part of the russian sphere of influence so the russians can influence matters within these countries uh and of course there is the military angle as well russia can project military power anytime it likes in these countries and also the economies are still to a to a significant extent quite integrated and many of these uh, leaders uh, owe a lot to 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 russia for for the power that they hold some of them you could consider them in a, to be in a way puppet regimes of russia the same way nato has a number of puppet regimes in various other various countries in a similar way the russians also do that so there are multiple reasons why these countries always support russia first of all they are kind of scared of russia the russians uh, the russians can can intervene militarily if they like if these countries go against russia the russians will not tolerate these countries going hand in hand with with america or nato or anything like that so these are the reasons you know it's it's at the end of the day it's all about hard power russia has the hard power to keep these countries in line so that's why countries like uzbekistan tajikistan etc uh they still uh, to the russian line they still have most of these countries they still have russian as the official language there are lots of uh, the economies are integrated to a, to a large extent and there are very deep relations with moscow so these are multiple reasons and of course if you look at the people there are lots of people to people contacts and the people still i believe would be nostalgic about the way the ussr used to be because i am sure there was more order and more uh, efficiency to some extent under the during the ussr days compared to how things are being run right, right now so these, these there are multiple reasons why this attitude is prevalent that the people still support russia and even the governments still uh, support russia so that's an interesting question shrey has uh, shrey has asked thank you very much uh let's bring in whom shall we bring in let's bring in mr mr raj hello namaste sir namaste namaste sir where are you from so i am from uh, patna and bihar okay great uh, what's your question sir sir my question is sir uh, what exactly happened in 97 1971 when india and pakistan went on a war and the western countries and china came with pakistan and russia came with india and is that the reason why india has, and russia has a really good relationship hmm good question good question raj thank you for the question and nice meeting you i'm going to now answer the question so the question is very interesting it's about 1971 but it's about geopolitics it's about un- india russia relations so it's a good question so what happened in 1971 is that the pakistanis launched an unprovoked attack on india and india had to retaliate the attack was uh, launched there were these air raids from east pakistan which was then east pakistan it's now bangladesh so india had to retaliate and the con- two countries went to war and the entire western block uh, the americans and of course those days the chinese were the chinese were becoming close to the americans so all these countries what they did was they opposed india and the americans even sent an aircraft carrier into the bay of bengal to intimidate india and prevent india from doing any significant damage to east pakistan 
And what the Americans found when they came to the Bay of Bengal is that there were Soviet nuclear submarines waiting for them in the Bay of Bengal. And that's why they were not able to go ahead. The USS Enterprise, I believe it was, the aircraft carrier, it was not able to go ahead and, and threaten India. And that's why India was able to, because of this support from the USSR, India was able to go ahead and uh, dismember Pakistan and, and free and liberate Bangladesh from the horrible genocide that the people of Bangladesh were suffering, mainly the, in the Bangladeshi Hindus. So the Americans, what they wanted, what they were doing is they were supporting the genocide of the of the Bangladeshi, of Bangladeshi people. They were supporting Pakistan in what Pakistan was doing. And they, they lecture us about human rights and all that today, right? So they were trying to prevent India from uh, pursuing its national interest. They were trying to support Pakistan. They were trying to support the Pakistani genocide in Bangladesh. And it is the USSR that stepped in, that intervened and prevented America from stopping India from doing its military action. So why did the Russians, why did the USSR do that? Because they needed India on their side. It's a geopolitical game. It's not because we are friends and we love each other. It's because it was in their national interest to uh, to ensure that the American uh, scheme was defeated. The American scheme was to encircle India from two sides, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. And the Pakistanis were, were, the, were America's client state. And that's why it was good for them because India had already aligned with the USSR. India was officially a member of the NAM, the non-aligned movement, but it was de facto a satellite state, you could say, of the USSR. So the Americans were very concerned about that. And that's why they were using Pakistan to counterbalance India and China as well. So all of these countries were against India. The USSR came to India's rescue and India was able to break up Pakistan and liberate Bangladesh. So it was not out of love for India or because they, they were friends with India, but because they needed this to happen from their own national interest perspective. So because India had aligned with the USSR, that's why the two interests were converging. They, they, were, they were aligned and that's why they helped India at the time. And uh, so, so that's what happened then. And today the situation is different. Russia is no longer as powerful as the USSR used to be. It's no longer a genuine superpower. It's a, it's the it's maybe the second most powerful military nation in the world. They have the world's largest nuclear arsenal. So it is beneficial for India to have a country like that on our side. So that's the situation that we are watching, that, that we are in today. Uh, it is no longer in a position to help India if there is a conflict with any other country, either Pakistan or China. But still, it is a great counterbalance against various countries that are not really very friendly towards India. The Chinese today are obviously uh, India's biggest adversary on, in the Eurasian uh, theater. And there are other countries also that are not quite friendly towards India. They don't really wish us very well, even though they may be in various kinds of uh, reasonably good relations, uh, relationships with us. So we need the Russians to counterbalance all that. And that's why... Uh, so that is the situation which which we are in today, which is very different from the 1971 situation. So that's the kind of brief historical background that I can offer you. So Raj, thank you very much. Very good question, sir. Nice meeting you. Okay, let us bring in Mr. Rishikesh. Hello. Hello, sir. Nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you, sir. Where are you from? I'm from Hubli, sir. Karnataka. Great, great. What's your question? So my question is that uh, Russia is, uh, is does not have any hatred to civilians, but it uh, it also mentioned that it would use the precision guided uh, weapons. But in the MST report, it has said that uh, they are using 9M79 to uh, Tochka ballistic missiles. And uh, how hazardous it might be as the Nostradamus predicted that uh, Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant leaks if that for is the nuclear power bank so. Okay, okay. Very good question, sir. Thank you for the question. I'm going to uh, answer it now. So, Amnesty International is reporting that the Russians are not doing what they should be doing. Uh, Russia should be using extremely precise weapons in order to carry out its, uh, in order to proceed with the military campaign. And apparently they're not doing that. They're using other weapons as well. 
so amnesty international supposedly is saying this uh, the question is <laughs> the question is what is the credibility of Am- amnesty international amnesty international is nothing but a propaganda organization amnesty international has been bashing india for decades right and they are essentially one of the various arms of the us that comes into your country and meddles in your internal affairs and and uh, refuse and issues various kinds of certificates to you so that's what amnesty international does i don't know i have not seen this report that that they have put out apparently with that uh, russians are using this missile or that missile the thing is this amnesty international has zero credibility so we don't even need to talk about them we don't need to listen to them we don't need to believe them they are simply a propaganda arm of the united states and and of the west i'm not saying it's a bad thing but we know the track record in india they are very much anti india and therefore we know that none of what they say is factual so this is uh, simply one of the ways of continuing the propaganda war against russia now what we know about what, how the russian military campaign is proceeding is that they are trying their best to minimize damage to ukrainian infrastructure and they are trying their best not to harm civilians right so they they in the initial hours of the of the military campaign they they hit various military installations in ukraine using uh using cruise missiles and those cruise missile strikes were very accurate within 2 3 hours the entire ukrainian air force was grounded right the russians had complete air superiority and after that they have been proceeding very slowly very carefully very circumspect they are doing their best not to not to even uh, break the traffic rules in ukraine that's how they are proceeding and now like uh, a couple of days ago this story came out there was this uh, fire fight at the i forget the name the nuclear power plant that rishikesh mentioned there was a fu- there was a fire fight there what has emerged is that the ukrainians started the fire fight were firing rocket propelled grenades from within the compound of the nuclear power plant and the russians were forced to retaliate and yet we know that there has been no significant damage to the power plant uh, or to the nuclear reactor so the nuclear reactor is safe and the ukrainians did this in order to make it look like the uh, russians have gone crazy and they are trying to blow up a nuclear power plant so the attempt that is repeatedly being witnessed they are they are the, the west is attempting to show mr putin as a madman as somebody who has lost all control of what he is doing is trying to blow up nuclear power plants nuclear reactors and is gone crazy the thing is this if you want if you if you want to destroy somebody you have to first give a justification for that you have to first show or portray them as mad if you portray somebody as as, as insane then it's okay to do whatever you want with them like in the middle ages in europe if you wanted to to destroy the life of 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 a woman you would all you would have to say is that she's a witch she's practicing witchcraft or she's practicing devil worship once you say that then you can do anything to her so that's the kind of thing that used to be there and today they are using similar tactics against mr putin they are trying to portray him as somebody who's gone mad which is not the case so that is the information warfare that we are witnessing information has been weaponized social media has been weaponized this is propaganda at a whole different level so so i think he's gone now okay very good uh, anyway very good question uh let us bring in om shala bring in let's bring in mr somia hello hi sir hi Yes, sir. Where are you from, sir? Sir, um, I am from Kolkata. Kolkata. All right. What's your question, sir? Uh, my question is: uh, it's a very simple question. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, could you tell me uh, any rational news channel where we can watch uh, the, this? Uh, what uh, what is happening now? <laughs> so we can track uh, the uh, true picture of this conflict, Russia and Ukraine conflict. very good question all right thank you for the question uh, so what somia ji has said is any good news channel i don't know any good news channel that's not the way i gather my news and information what i do is i don't watch the news at all i don't watch bbc cnn al jazeera or rt or whatever it is or any indian news channel i don't watch the news at all 
I get, gather my information from online sources. I don't watch, I, I don't do that all day. But if you do it from a variety of sources, then you will get a good balanced picture. Because you know that when you see the when you look at the news from the CNN feed, it will have a Western flavor. If you look at New York Times, Washington Post, if you look at the BBC, if you look at the Guardian, you will see news that is biased in a certain way. If you look at, uh, let's say, Indian uh, news outlets, they will have a different kind of bias. If you look at the uh, Russian news outlets, they will have a different kind of bias. If you look at a Chin Chinese outlet, news uh, outlet, media outlet, they will have a Chinese slant or bias. And if you go on Twitter, you will have lots of impartial uh, people as well putting out all kinds of opinions. So if you do that, then you will get a whole well-rounded perspective and then you need to use your own judgment to come to the conclusions as, as to what is really happening. So that is how I do it. I don't have any one source that I go to. I don't trust any one source. I look at lots of different sources and then I make my own judgments as, as to what's really happening. And of course, it helps if you know history, then it's not easy for them for people to fool you. So that's what I do. That's the philosophy I use. Maybe you all can also do it. And Somiji, thank you very much for the question. It's a very interesting question. Thank you. Okay, let's bring in somebody else. Uh, people are waving their hands. Everybody is waiting. Let's bring in Mr. Ishwara. Hello. Hi. Hi, where Hi. are you from, sir? I'm from Bangalore. Nice to meet you, sir. What's your question? I'm audible, sir. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, from past uh, 100 years, uh, there's a concept of uh, neutral countries like uh, Switzerland, Ireland, Finland, Austria, and etc. Have uh, their status or their neutrality faded away in this current situation? And uh, does Putin want uh, Ukraine to be the next Finland? Hmm. Okay, very good question, Ishwaraji. Thank you very much. Let me answer that. So what Ishwar said is that there are a number of countries that have typically, historically, over the past 100 or so years, been neutral. Let's take the example of Switzerland. So Switzerland is famous for its neutral status, right? They don't participate in any war. They don't get involved in politics and so on and so forth. They are neutral. That's what we see them as. So Switzerland is a neutral country and some other countries also have similar statuses. Now let's look at why a country like Switzerland would do that. Switzerland is a very small, tiny country, right? A small country like that is easy. It's an easy target for any big country if they want to come and capture that country and take away all the resources. So Switzerland says we are neutral. We will not participate in any conflict, any political thing, any geopolitical um, matter will stay out of all of this. And they also, the Swiss, they also provide a very valuable service. You know what the service is? They are the world's bankers. They have the very famous Swiss banks where people deposit their savings. And uh, the, the thing about the Swiss banks, it used to be this way that they would never ask you any questions as to where you got the money from. How did you acquire the money? They will not ask you. You can go there and in perfect anonymity, stash your cash. So what happened is that Switzerland became the favorite place for all kinds of corrupt politicians and criminals and smugglers and all that to go and dump their money. And they knew that it will remain safe in Switzerland. We also know that lots of Nazi treasure was stashed away in Switzerland, in these, in these Swiss banks. And many of these Nazis did not ever get a chance to go back and reclaim the money because they would have got killed in the Second World War and so on. So that's the service that Switzerland, Switzerland provided to various nations all across the world. And that's why it was valuable as a country that remained independent. So it's not, the Swiss were not able to remain independent because they were neutral. They were able to remain independent and untouched by everybody because they provided a very valuable service to everyone. Right. So um, Switzerland is not actually neutral. They, they, are, they are looking out for their own self-interest. It's a very small country. It's easy for any country to come and gobble it up. Right. And they don't even have a standing army. Uh, they have this compulsory military service that every um, adult male has to undergo and all adult males i believe who are uh, who are physically fit etc they are issued a weapon that they can 
use when required and so on and so forth. So, so that's the strange concept of neutrality. And other countries also have tried such things. And then we also had the so-called non-aligned movement, which never got anybody anywhere. So that's uh, the kind of information I can offer about neutral countries with the example of Switzerland. Uh, the other question was, does Mr. Putin want to Finlandize Ukraine? I don't think he wants to Finlandize Ukraine. He wants to uh, effect a regime change and, and, and install a new government that is pro-Russia and maybe even take up take out parts of Ukraine which are Russian majority and integrate them into Russia. So that is what I can say. So very good question, Ishwar. Thank you very much. Okay, let's bring in Sunil Surana. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you doing, Namaste. sir? Where are you from? Namaste. I am from Ichel Karanji. Okay. Ichel Karanji, yeah. So, my question okay. is uh, some countries, despite being obvious enemies, for example, India, Pakistan, India, China, still they carry on trade between them. Uh, so, like, mm -hmm. why so? I'm not sure if it's a valid question, but you. It's a valid question. Yeah, yeah sure. It's, it's a geopolitics question, so I'll take it. All right, sir. Thank you very much. So why do countries that are that have a conflicted relationship, an adversarial relationship, maybe countries that have gone to war with each other, why do they still engage in mutual trade? That's, a, that's an interesting thing about the world. So it's a good question. For instance, India and China, everyone knows these are adversarial countries. They have an adversarial relationship. The Chinese occupy parts of our territory illegally. We have gone to war three times with China. 1962, we lost to China. They took away Aksai Chin and some other parts of our territory. 1967, they again attacked us. India defeated China in the 1967 war, which your history textbooks will not teach you. And in 19, in the late 19, 1980s also, I think it was 88, there was another, another clash which India won. So we have a very bad relationship with China. They lay claim on our territory even today, Arunachal Pradesh and so on and so forth. More of it. And still we have a significant amount of trade with China. So why is that so? Because trade is separate from, from warfare. You can weaponize trade also. But there are things in India that the Chinese would like. Uh, the Chinese use India for raw materials. And then they send you send back to India their finished products. And because of this, because raw materials are cheaper and finished products are more expensive, that's why they are enjoying this big trade surplus with India. And so the trade surplus, I don't remember what the exact figure is. It used to be a few years ago. A few years ago, it was about $90 billion or so. Maybe it is less now, maybe 30 or 50 or something billion dollars per year. So that's a significant trade surplus they are enjoying. And India also wants to continue the trade. So, so it's all about mutual benefit. We need something from them. They need something from us. So as long as we are not at war, we will continue trade. And we will uh, grow our, our economy in whatever way we can. So that's how it typically goes. Countries that are enemies still trade. India and Pakistan also trade, right? A few years ago, India had given the most favored nation status to the Pakistanis. Even the US and USSR used to have trade during the Cold War days. So that's how it typically is. Even when you are enemies, you still want to make money. You still want to benefit as much as you can, even from your enemy. <laughs> that's how it goes. So that's just the way of the, of the world. And as long as there is no hostility going on right now, we will trade and we'll make money as, as far as there is mutual benefit. So that that's the way it's always been, historically also in the past. All right, Sunil. So thank you very much you. for the question. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Nice meeting you. Bye. Okay, let's bring in somebody else. Let's bring in Mr. Ashu. Hello. Namaste, sir. Namaste, Namaste, Namaste Ashu ji. Where are you from, sir? Sir, Gurgaon, Haryana. Nice to meet you, sir. What's your question? Sir, my question is, sir, uh, Russia is now threatening or warning uh, Sweden and Finland. Both these countries uh, also want to join NATO and already are part of EU. Uh, so, sir, my question is, should they join NATO for their defense 
or they should remain neutral or maybe more inclined towards russia because of what happening with ukraine or is it a matter of concern uh, for russia very good very short very crisp thank question you. appreciate it thank you very much i'm going to answer it now so what ashu said is that russia is threatening various countries finland uh, and the other country that he mentioned poland i suppose so there are see it's like this there used to be a warsaw pact a, the warsaw pact was an anti anti nato alliance of the soviet bloc so i think a number of countries were part of the warsaw pact poland was the ussr obviously was there poland uh, albania czechoslovakia czechoslovakia romania and various other countries i think seven, there were seven eight countries in that so this was called the soviet bloc of countries in eastern europe so that's where the ussr uh, had its uh, the, its its sphere of influence now after the ussr broke up the Russia, the russians russia was the biggest uh, nation that came out of it and they were given this uh, assurance in 1991 by the us that nato will not expand even 1 inch eastwards and and the americans have broken that promise imme- almost immediately in the in 1999 a number of countries came into nato and they have been expanding steadily eastwards ever since and eventually it became a, a matter of life and death life or death for for russia and that's why we have the ukraine conflict going on now so what we are seeing is that finland seeks to join nato ukraine also seeks to join nato and various other countries also seek to join nato and uh, that's why is it so because nato is right now more powerful if russia was as powerful as the ussr they would not dare to express the thought that we want to join nato so it's that's how it works in the world whoever is more powerful you want to be on their good side so right now right now what we are finding what we are seeing is that the chinese power is growing and the russian power is already there it's constant and because china and russia are working together the overall power of the of the eastern bloc the china russia bloc is growing it's expanding and therefore Uh, because uh, the uh, the russians are funded by china they have the guarantee that the chinese will support them that's why they are not really very badly affected by whatever sanctions are coming their way obviously there will be some a significant effect uh, even then but they have the the backing of the chinese so now russia is no longer a waning power it may be perhaps a strong enough power that can threaten various nato countries and we have seen what they what they've been able to do in ukraine so now the status is different earlier nato was all powerful the us was all powerful russia was a broken country now the russian power power seems to be growing again and the question every country needs to ask itself is will america be able to save them if something goes wrong right so if they apply to join nato the process will take some time in the meanwhile the russians will not like it and they may come and invade you as well will the americans be able to save you they were not able to save ukraine right so that's the question every country needs to ask so it's all about who is more powerful everybody wants to be on the good side of of whoever is no more powerful and that's why nato was expanding all the time but now it's very clearly visible that the americans their power now has limits earlier they their their power had no limits all across the all, all across the planet but now we are seeing that their power is waning they have they have been forced to withdraw from afghanistan they have left this big power vacuum in central asia and now you can see they've they've lost ukraine as well so it is visible their decline is now visible and obviously there will be repercussions to, the, to that they will not give up so easily and the conflict could be in europe the 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 fight for for supremacy which country will come on whose side so the smaller countries will get caught in that unfortunately it looks like that so that's what i can say i cannot make a prediction as to what will happen will finland join nato or not if they try to join nato they may face some serious consequences from the russians maybe maybe not depending on the calculations of how far mr putin thinks he can go at this point in time maybe 5 years in the future he may have a different kind of plan so that's where we are right now it's an interesting situation we are now living in interesting times very interesting times and the world is going to change very rapidly in the coming decade So very interesting question Ashu thank you for the for asking the question nice meeting you Okay 
whom shall we shall we bring in okay mr banu is back let's bring in mr banu hello good evening sir good evening banu good evening you're from jammu right yes sir okay great what's your question so one of the articles of nato states that uh, you cannot invade a country but if a small part of country wants to become independent or are not treated properly then the neighboring country may help them russia has done the same and uh, us has been doing it uh, in the various parts of the world like vietnam uh, afghanistan and many more so can india invade baluchistan uh, using this article and should india really invade baluchistan very good question banu thank you for the question i'll answer it now so the so banu mentioned some article in the nato charter which says that a country can do so and so things see nato doesn't get to set the rules in the world right nato is an is an alliance of a, a certain number of countries and these rules apply to those countries only right so we cannot say, cite a certain nato article and say that we can start uh, doing things according to that because the article the charter or whatever it is it, it applies only to the member nations and even if they say that these things are allowed it doesn't mean that they can impose that rule or that charter all over the world right they talk about a rules based order but they break the rules all the time they can set the rules anytime they want they can break the rules anytime they want so it's so what can india do what can india not do it all depends on how strong india is and that's all it is right what a country can do depends on the country's overall power and standing and stature on the geopolitical global arena if you are strong enough powerful enough you can do anything you wish if you are not strong if you're not powerful then you can do nothing people will even come and tell you what to do internally in your own country so if india wants to free balochistan it doesn't need to cite an article in the nato charter if india is strong enough it can go and go ahead and do that tomorrow right now india is not powerful enough to do such a thing without facing adverse consequences so that's what i can say right so the nato charter or article has no relevance to india to asia or to any other country it all depends on how strong you are the chinese for instance they they have broken the agreement they had with the uk that hong kong would be under one country two two systems they broke the agreement they broke the the uh the treaty they had similarly similarly the americans broke the iran uh, nuclear deal it was a treaty they had signed and they just walked away from it unilaterally so if you are strong enough you can do it we know the americans have intervened militarily in various countries they have invaded afghanistan iraq twice libya so if you are strong enough you can do it you don't need to cite anything you can do it because you can all right banu uh good question and nice seeing you go see seeing you again All right. Let us bring in somebody who's been waiting for a while. Uh, let's bring in Abhay. Hello. Hello, sir. Thank you so much for taking me. Uh, Abhay here from Bhopal. Here, my question nice was. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. My question was related to uh, that when we are negative on the side of geopolitics today, and uh, like USA is anti-Russia for sure. and with sanctions on russia certainly it is going to be a sanction or economic uh, spell that is being provided to china as well so is it is a good situation for us as well to be emerge as a superpower economically as well while the usa we have got the stealth of usa at the same point of time and uh, the sanctions are going to also impact pakistan and uh, china as well along with russia Okay good question thank you for the question i will answer it now so um the question is is this the right time for india to emerge as an economic superpower so wh- what is the definition of an economic superpower the definition of an economic superpower is a country that has its economic systems accepted all around the world for instance the entire uh, economic all the institutions etc economic institutions are controlled by the us the world bank the imf imf etc and the us dollar is the reserve currency that's accepted all across the world so that's why the us is an economic superpower now for india to become an economic superpower firstly our economy will have to triple at least right now our economy is about 3 trillion dollars worth right gdp it needs to become at least 10 trillion dollars 
of GDP for us to be even considered to be a major economic power. So that's a long way away. Even if there are sanctions on Russia and it will affect China badly or Pakistan badly, it doesn't mean it's going to be great for us. We are still uh, dealing with the COVID recession, which has dragged us down in the last two, three years. And uh, India needs to, if India wants to grow to the status of $10 trillion of, of GDP, it's going to be a long hole ahead of us. So you can't become an economic superpower overnight. The sanctions will uh, will affect Russia, but it may benefit China because the Russians are now driven into the Chinese arms. So it's a very complicated situation. The sanctions may affect Pakistan, but depending on how, how the Russians deal with Iran, Pakistan may again come into the good side of the US. For instance, if the Russians and the Chinese are cooperating financially, economically and militarily with Iran, then the Americans will again look at Pakistan as a way of counterbalancing Iran, even if it affects India badly. Right. So in that case, they may again go and whoop woo the, woo the Pakistanis. They may be able to give more money to the Pakistanis than the Chinese can. In that case, Pakistan again becomes a good, a good doggy of the Americans. Right. So the situation is right now very, very uh, complex. It's very, it's changing very fast. And India is not in a position to call itself uh, an economic superpower anytime in the near future. It will take at least 10 years, most likely 20 years, if we are to be more realistic, to reach the $10 trillion uh, mark. When it, When we are there, then we may be a major power economically and not yet a superpower. We have to reach the fifteen trillion 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 dollar mark to be a real superpower. But it 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 can be considered to be superpower only if we have a similar military strength. So the situation is very complex. Just because there are sanctions right now doesn't mean that we are now in one or two years going to be a superpower. No, no, no. It's it's very much very difficult. It's a it's a difficult road ahead, and there are lots of struggles we are going to face. Uh, because the Americans are sanctioning Russia, it doesn't mean that they are our good friends. They are threatening, threatening to sanction India as well. The CATSA sanctions is something that they are considering right now because India is purchasing the S-400 missile defense system from the Russians. And that is something the Americans are not happy about. So they may sanction India as well. So being a superpower is nice, but it is still a very, very long, long, long road ahead for us. So that's where we are right now. It's a it's an interplay of multiple uh, of multiple domains in geopolitics: the global system, the global supply chains, the economic systems, the, the financial uh, superstructure of the geopolitical arena. The military dimension is there. The various alliances are there. Very complex. So India right now is a small economy, three trillion three trillion dollars. Yeah, sure, we are in the top five, top six in the world, but that should not be cause for celebration. We have a long road ahead of us. All right, sir. Abhay, thank you very much. Very good question. Nice meeting you. Okay, let's... Uh, whom shall we bring in? Let's bring in Ronesh Kumar. Hello. Hi, sir. How are you? I'm very well, sir. How are you doing? Where are you from? I'm from Toronto, Canada. So, yeah, as always, my Sunday morning is starting with your show. Yeah. Oh, very nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. What's your question? Yes. So my question is, uh, currently India has taken a neutral stand and I won't go in the that they should have taken it or not because there are seem to be valid argument on each side. But unlike China, which are a self-reliant superpower, so India is very, very far away from that. And uh, so my question was, so again, this thing is emerging that India needs to be self-reliant. India needs to become an economic superpower. And that's not possible without them becoming a manufacturing superpower like China. But in some of your earlier shows, you had hinted towards that US had assisted China a lot in that. And the same as maybe Japan and South Korea. So my question is that, is India in a position that they can become a manufacturing or on a larger level an economic superpower without the West assistant, assistance? and currently with their uh, current stance that they have taken. Excellent question, sir. Very good question. I'll answer it now. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you again. This is a brilliant question. So the China, the rise of China happened. It's a very, very rapid and meteoric rise. They came from nowhere and became a genuine uh, 
economic large power, almost a superpower, you could say. And this happened because the United States aided and abetted the rise of China. They brought China in the, the, into the global economic system. They integrated China into the global economic system. They outsourced all of their manufacturing requirements to China. And they became China's biggest market that the Chinese could sell to. And that's why the Chinese were able to grow at more than 10% per year for such a long time. And that's how they were able to grow their economy so fast. That so-called Chinese miracle was actually done by the US. And similarly, the Japanese economic miracle also happened because Japan was integrated into the US economy. Japan is obviously, as we know, uh, as I hope you guys know, it is under US occupation even today. It's not really a sovereign country. So the Japanese rose very fast. In the 1980s, they became almost like a financial economic superpower, the number two economy in the world. And then something strange happened in the Japanese economy suddenly became stagnant somehow, magically, as if somebody switched off a button. And the South Koreans also grew very fast because of American help and so on. So it's a very interesting observation that Ronesh has done. Now that the challenge for India is that India also wants to rise like this, but the Americans are not going to help us the way they help the Chinese or the Japanese or the South Koreans. The Americans, they see India as a big market, 1.3 billion people. So it's a market that they want to keep selling things to. They want India to be a nation of consumers, not a nation of producers. They don't want to see another big economic miracle that comes up and becomes another, another challenge to them. So it's going to be a very big challenge for India to rise under these circumstances economically. If India wants to reach the $10 trillion mark in the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to have to grow at close to 10% a year or more than that for at least a decade or if not more. And how do we do that? Manufacturing is the way to, to go. But who's going to buy what we manufacture? There is a huge big world out there. But much of the world is what we call the third world. They don't have that much spending power. So if you manufacture all kinds of goods, items, etc., et who's going to buy it? Uh, so that's the challenge India faces right now. And that's a, that's a very big challenge. So I'm not sure I have the answer. See, some things are very difficult. Some, some questions are not easy to answer. So it's for the government to find ways of doing it. Right. So one of the ways is to is to uh, is to start creating infrastructure which will give rise to jobs and all that. For instance, when you had the Japanese tsunami in 2011, it led to a sh to a reasonable boom in the economy because so much destruction happened as as a consequence of the tsunami, and a lot of nation rebuilding had to be done. So it gave rise to lots of jobs and lots of uh, contracts, you know, civil engineering contracts and all that. So that is one way of creating a boom. So in India, there is no tsunami, but the nation needs a lot of infrastructure. We have no infrastructure. We need roads, railways, airports, ports. We need a lot of all that. So maybe we could do that. Maybe we could use that as a way of starting our uh, manufacturing output. And there are other things we can also do. There are various other countries that we can align with, not necessarily only the US. Of course, if the US is willing to help, great. So there are solutions, but the solutions are not as straightforward as the one that the Chinese had. They just sell to the US and uh, take away all their manufacturing. India is going to have to use a different approach, but I am sure the solutions are out there. So Ronesh has asked a very good question. It's a very valid question. It's a, diff a different kind of challenge that India is facing. So good question, sir. And nice meeting you again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. See Thank you. you. All right. Uh, let us bring in who has been waiting. Let's bring in. Uh, let's bring in Rishab. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Good morning. Uh, good. I'm good in... morning, sir. Where are you? Where are you uh, from? Sir, sir, currently I'm in USA and I'm from Indore, Madhya Pradesh. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. What's your question? Uh, sir, my question is that uh, as uh, Ukraine has used uh, like many Indian students as a hostages, so in future, like uh, India will ever take a revenge or something like that to give answer that the thing which was done by Ukraine was not ethical. And uh, so like um, 
and uh, like china also funds uh, other uh, news outlets in other country so why uh, why don't india do such kind of funding at least at a small level to spread their propaganda and indian perspective to the western world or to the other places okay all right sir very good question nice to meet you thank you i'm going to answer it now so the question is will india take revenge on ukraine <laughs> the 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 focus for india right now should be on getting all of our citizens out of ukraine and back to safety back in india uh, the ukrainians as uh, rishab pointed out are indeed holding indian students as hostages they are using them employing them as human shields there has been a lot of racism there has been a lot of brutality uh, even the bbc was forced to report that that's how widespread it has been so that is indeed the case what needs to happen is right now don't think about revenge just just get everybody out of that country right and then what what's going to happen is once we have all the people out of the country in the next 10 days or so i expect that the russian military objectives will be achieved and then ukraine as we know it will essentially cease to exist you will have a new government the russians are going to install a different government this they are going to oust uh, mr zelensky and then the government which will be in place there will be a pro russia and i suppose more pro india government so then what's the, the the question of taking revenge doesn't actually arise because then the government is going to be pro india and let's say india wants to take revenge is india in a position to go and take revenge i mean in what form do we exact this revenge do we send our army there it's not feasible for india to send an expeditionary force an armed force all the way those thousands of kilometers <clears throat> excuse me all the way to ukraine right you need supply lines and all that so it's it's not really uh practical to do that and india doesn't control the global economy so you can't even impose financial sanctions and all that as long as you are not a very big and powerful country sometimes you have to swallow these insults and just do the best you can to to bring your citizens back to safety so that's what i can say all we have to do right now is ensure that every last indian gets out of ukraine safely and is brought back home and then we will see what the russians do in ukraine they're going to install a different government and uh, so that's how it's going to do that that's how, how it is going to proceed okay rashab thank you for the question nice meeting you again uh let's bring in akshit hello hi sir hi sir hello i am akshit hello, i am you? from himachal pradesh and i am doing uh, i am in delhi currently so i have a question that uh, india has a population of 140 billion and uk has a population of 8 crores but we have comparatively equal gdp how is it possible sir how how 130 uh, 140 uh, 140 crore people can match 8 crore people are indian so dumb are we so dumb people that we can match uh, mm. we are uh, we are equivalent to uk 8 crore people are equal to 130 crore people is government fudging the data or is it uh, the real data how we can know okay. that india's gdp is equal to uk okay good question sir uh, i'll answer it now so akshit says i U, uk not ukraine i heard ukraine first so india's gdp is more or less equal to the uk's gdp our gdp whatever it's around 3 trillion dollars and the uk's gdp is the same and our population is obviously 1.3 billion and theirs is much much smaller than ours so how do you calculate the gdp economists have a variety of ways of calculating your gross domain your gross domestic product per year so uh, i am not an economist so i cannot give you the details of how it is done but there is a, there is a proper methodology of doing it so it's quite transparent and i think it's it's well known what india's gdp is and the uk's gdp is so the question is we have such a huge population their their population is so small so how come the two nations have the same gdp well if you look at history if you look at historical data of the past 2000 years 
historically india's gdp used to be more than one third of the entire world's gdp that's how big india's gdp was so what happened the uk came to india the english came to india and stole away all of our wealth and treasure and everything they destroyed india's economy india was <clears throat> the world's first industrialized fully industrialized civilization the british destroyed all of india's indigenous industries they destroyed all of our uh, our technology we, we we were a very technologically advanced nation and because of that we were the world's largest economy more than one third of the entire world's gdp was india's right and by the time so when the british came to india india accounted for more than the one third of the whole world's gdp by the time the british left in 1947 india accounted for less than 2% of the world's gdp so you can guess where all the money went and what where all the productivity went all of it was transferred to the uk it was all stolen to the uk to the uk it is estimated that the british stole approximately 45 trillion dollars worth of treasure and money and all that from india they can never repay it and because of that their economy grew so much and that's why it is the way it is today it, they are enjoying the they are enjoying the stolen wealth the, the the wealth that they stole from india and because they destroyed india's economy that's why our economy is so small today it is growing again now so after 1947 india's economy could have grown very fast but what happened is that we had the great shri nehru who imposed the nehruvian rate of growth he refused to kick start india's economy and so our economy stagnated until the 1990s now it is growing faster and that's what we are seeing so if you look at the per capita gdp if you look at the gdp total gdp and divide by the population then india is a very low income nation and the western countries are very high income nations i'm not sure what is the current uh, per capita gdp it must be less than 2000 dollars per, per it must be to less than 2000 dollars in the case of the uk us it must be more than 50000 dollars in the case of china it's like around 10000 dollars roughly i don't have the exact figures so the real uh, level of prosperity of a country is 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 measured measured in terms of gdp per capita not total gdp total gdp is good for india it's around 3 trillion dollars it's in the top 5 or top six, top 6 in the world but if you look at per capita gdp india is a very poor country because the average wealth per person is very low, very less so it's because of what happened in the last 1000 years first we were occupied by the turks then we were occupied by the british and the british destroyed india's economy thoroughly today we are just rising from the dead so that's why we are where we are today it's not because the indian government is incompetent or it is not doing its job it's because of what happened in the last 500 to 1000 years so no matter how good your government is it's going to take time for your gdp graph to go higher and higher it's going to take time it's going to take at least 10 20 years minimum for india to become a 10 trillion dollar economy minimum 20 years 10 to 20 years so it's not the government's fault this government right now it is not their fault india's economy is broken or it is the way it is it's because of the what the foreign occupiers did to india all right so interesting question akshit nice meeting you okay let's bring in somebody else uh let's bring in vishwanath uh, could you unmute yourself please i can't hear you oh sorry yeah hello sir from bangalore nice to talk to you nice to meet you nice to meet you yeah uh is is it the right time uh, for india to look into uh, the chinese occupied part of india uh, or the pakistan occupied part of india okay very good very short brief question thank you so much uh, i'm going to answer it is it the right time for india to think about retaking chinese occupied aksai chin or pakistan occupied kashmir so when is it the right time for any nation to take back territory from a different country which is currently taken by the other country you can do it when you know that if you take this action there's going to be no adverse uh consequences that you will have to face right so right now if you go and try to take back aksai chin from the chinese do you expect the chinese not to retaliate in some way they're going to retaliate they are a much more powerful economy than ours and they have a better military strength than us 
So there's going to be a retaliation from the Chinese. Are we prepared to absorb that retaliation? Are we prepared to absorb the damage? Are we in a position to go to war with China right now? Obviously, we are not. So it is not the right time for India to even think of taking back Aksai Chin. When it comes to Pakistan occupied Kashmir, Gilgit Baltistan, etc., the Pakistanis are a client state of the Chinese. They have nuclear weapons. Does India want to start a war with a nuclear powered state right now? Is India that powerful today? Obviously, India is not that powerful today. India cannot think of starting a war with anybody when India is trying to grow its economy. We cannot afford to have any kind of damage to our infrastructure, to our country, to our economy. Only when India becomes a genuine superpower can we think of doing these things. But the thing about becoming a genuine superpower is that you don't even have to go to war. Everybody wants to be your friend. That's how it works. So you can win your wars without firing a single bullet if you grow your economy and your military strength to a certain extent. So right now, we need to forget about POK. We need to forget about Aksai Chin. We need to forget about all of that. We need to focus on building our economy and our military might. Next 20 years, just focus on building the economy. Work very hard. And then you will find that magically all the problems will go away. So the solution to all the problems for India right now is to focus on building up our economic strength. Because as your economy grows, you can spend more on your military as well. So all the problems, they have the same solution. Build your economy. Focus on building up the economy. That's what we need to do right now. Forget about POK. Forget about accession for the next 20 years. There will be a time for all of that. But the time is not now. All right. So a good question. And uh, let's bring in somebody else. So Vishwanath, thank you very much. Good question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> whom shall I bring in? Let's bring in uh, um, Shreyas. Hello. Hi. Um, I am from Mumbai. Nice to meet you, sir. Um, uh, my question to you is that if China invades Taiwan and we secure Sri Lanka, then the Chinese debt that is in Sri Lanka, will that be cancelled off or China will go uh, and take international uh, maybe protest against us that, oh, we have invested so much in Sri Lanka and India has already secured Sri Lanka. That is my question. Okay, very good question, Shreyas. Thank you. Let me answer that. So if the Chinese invade Taiwan and India secures Sri Lanka. So the question is, like, like I use the word secure and people don't really know what it means. By secure, I mean make sure that the Chinese cannot come and interfere there. That's what I mean. I don't mean that we should go and invade and annex the country. Same goes with Nepal. I said India should secure Nepal and ensure that Nepal's territorial integrity and sovereignty is safeguarded. That's what I mean. So, uh, but what uh, Shreya says, said just now is, of course, quite, uh, quite interesting and important because the Chinese have trapped Sri Lanka in their infamous debt trap. And the Sri Lankans... Uh, took a Chinese loan at ridiculous interest rates and now they are unable to repay it. And that's why the Chinese are now grabbing Sri Lankan territory. They've taken over possession of the, of the port that the Sri Lankans had built. And this is the, the way the Chinese expand their, their, uh, their territorial footprint and strategic footprint in various countries. So, so one thing India can do is give the money to Sri Lanka to pay off the Chinese debt. That way the Sri Lankans are free of the Chinese, but there has to be strings attached. You can't just get the money for free. You have to give us something in return. So maybe India can invest in the port or do something like that. So India needs to find creative ways of extricating Sri Lanka from the, from the trap they have fallen into. And the question is, how do the Chinese get countries to fall into these debt traps. They do it by bribes. They bribe whoever is the politician who's running the country, give them a few million dollars, maybe a, maybe more than a few million dollars, and get them to sign on the contract that traps the country into that ridiculous uh, interest rate that cannot be repaid. So that's how, did they, how they do it. So if the Chinese invade Taiwan, so the, the thing is this, I don't expect the Chinese 
to be in a position to invade Taiwan right now. Like I said just now, there is a time and a place for everything. Right now, India cannot think of taking uh, Aksai Chin or Pakistan occupied Kashmir because the time is not right. India has other, other priorities. Similarly, I don't think the time is right for the Chinese to make a move on Taiwan because Taiwan is a red line for the Americans. The Americans simply cannot afford to allow the Chinese to take Taiwan because then the, the entire supremacy, hegemony that the Americans have built up will be broken. Nobody will trust the Americans anymore. The Americans will no longer be the guarantors of safety in the world. They will not be able to dictate the rules that the world must follow. If the Chinese succeed in capturing Taiwan, American hegemony is broken. America is no longer a superpower. America is humiliated. So the Americans will not allow this to happen. If the Chinese make a move on Taiwan, there's going to be a very, very significant retaliation. And the Chinese know that. That's why the Chinese will not try to take Taiwan right now. They will wait for a few more years. In the, in, in the meanwhile, they may try to make a move on India. So these, these are the things that are happening right now. We need to be prepared for that. So uh, I don't expect a Chinese move on Taiwan right now. It is more likely that they may make a move on India and try to create some mischief. So that's where we are. So Shreyas, thank you very much. Good question. Nice meeting you. Okay, let's bring in Girish. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, uh, hi. Where are you from? Hello. I am from uh, Lonar. Lonar. Uh, my coach, Lonar. Okay, Lunar great. Lonar district. Okay. What's your question? Um, my question is, sir, sir can uh, India, China, Russia and other uh, Asian countries can make their own uh, treaty organization just like NATO to counter Western countries? Good question. Good question, Girish. Okay, let me answer that. So can India, Russia, China and various other Asian countries form their own alliance to counter NATO or, or the US hegemony? That's a very interesting question. Uh, there is certainly going to be a temptation among Asian countries to make their own, to form their own coalition, their own bloc, their own um, alliance, uh, which uh, could possibly uh, offset the US hegemony in the world. Right now, what we are seeing is that people, the various countries are now kind of getting fed up of US hegemony. The Americans have been dictating how people should behave, what people should do, what people should not do for a very long time. And now the Russians have pushed back. They have shown the world that the Americans were unable to protect Ukraine. The Americans made some promises, but then they did not keep it. They essentially abandoned Ukraine. And they have imposed a whole bucket load of sanctions on the Russians. So what they have done is that they, they, have, they, they have put Mr. Putin in a position where he has nothing more to lose. How many more sanctions can they throw at him? They've already thrown the whole kitchen sink at him. So now they, what they've done is they have pushed Russia and China together. The Russians and Chinese can now be looked upon as al almost like an alliance. And if they really want to reshape the world order, they will need one more large powerful country. The two of them are not enough to reshape the world order. What they really seek to do is to make a new world order or, or to bipolarize the world. Right now, the world is a unipolar world. The entire world is run by one system, the, the global system, which is essentially controlled by the Americans. All the financial institutions are theirs. The reserve currency is theirs, and so on and so forth. The, so what the Chinese and the Russians want to do is that they want to create a parallel system. But these two countries are not enough. So they may want, possibly, India to become part of that parallel system. But it's not possible when India and China have such an adversarial relationship such an antagonistic relationship. So we don't know if there is a resolution to this. If the Chinese really want India to come into that fold, then they may have to give some big incentives to India. Because obviously the Americans won't like it and then America will, will put impose sanctions on India as well. So, so right now we don't have answers to these questions. We don't know what's going to happen, what these leaders are planning, what India is planning, what the Chinese are planning, what are we forecasting from the Indian side? What way is the world going to move towards? So right now, everything is up in the air. We don't quite know. 
it all depends on the next five moves the chinese made make the next five moves the americans make what direction russia takes and what choices india also will make so all of these things will determine the way the world is going to move towards in the next few years i expect that in the next few years you're going to see a lot of chaos it's going to be a very interesting time so that's what i can say we don't have any definitive answers yet but it is certainly a possibility that you may eventually see the emergence of an eastern block of nations india china russia and various other smaller countries it, it is possible depending on how things are taken forward so good question girish okay let's bring in whom shall i bring in let's bring in girish hello hello sir uh, hi, my nice name is girish hi i'm uh, calling from stuttgart i'm uh, stuttgart 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 germany yes, yes. so uh, i'm a fan of your ideas i'm a fan of your work i'm uh, it's incredible you're answering so uh, questions eloquently so you, my question is uh, in the india's political history this is the best time considering the absolute majority it has to take any decision mm-hmm. but uh, but uh, if you see on the ground uh, it is very relatively easy to influence neighboring nations like uh, uh, sri lanka bangladesh and nepal by they are all smaller economies so sri lanka is struggling to pay off its uh, relatively small debt of 3 billion dollars and india's is 3 trillion nearly so why it is not doing to influence these countries these are smaller economies and uh, you can deal with all say 20 30 billion uh, that is one and second one is uh, of course india's economy should uh, related to one that question. okay one question one question okay so related to these countries also our uh, our uh, reserve on the uh, military expenditure is also going down year after year if you compare to the gdp so this is a kind of contrary to what we want to be with the best majority and it uh, it's really scary if the majority is not there if there is a kichri government then it's going to be even more difficult uh, yeah that's my question okay thank you so much for the question let me answer that nice meeting you again so uh yeah india has the indian government which is currently in power has a absolute majority in parliament which means that theoretically they should be able to do whatever they want now like girish mentioned a country like sri lanka is right now trapped in the debt trap of china they are not able to repay the loan which is like he said about 3 billion dollars i don't have the exact statistics but let's say what he is saying is correct so india could help sri lanka out and extricate it from the difficult position it is in the question is what does india get in return there are no free lunches in the world in geopolitics you do everything for a certain purpose when you put a certain amount of money in a certain thing you expect something back there are no free gifts no free lunches and the problem is that we are not the only country that is in a position to influence let's say sri lanka or bangladesh lots of other powerful countries are vying for the same influence in our region in the indian subcontinental region for instance the chinese have deeper pockets than india if they want they can influence bangladesh to a greater degree than india the americans also have deeper pockets and they can also influence these countries and many of these countries that i just mentioned don't really want india's influence to grow so india is currently uh, not currently india has always been in this magnificent position in the indian ocean region india dominates the entire region and yet india as of today doesn't is not in a position to exert any strategic influence far beyond its shores so that's not because india is not powerful enough or india is not trying to do so but because there are more powerful countries that are already in control of these of these uh, things that we are not able to quite see right now so uh, despite having a brute majority in parliament the thing is that power doesn't we have to understand what power is power doesn't arise from the number of votes you get or the number of seats you have in parliament power is a whole different thing there are extra governmental extra democratic power structures that exist in the world in every country that are not quite visible to us right 
so power depends on how many levers or in the country you can control and there are lots of things that you can control without ever having a single seat in parliament so it's like that so so just because you have a majority in parliament doesn't mean that you can do everything for instance the indian federal structure is that you the central government cannot tell states what to do even if it uh, it will sign an agreement with a diff- with a certain country to have let's say a bullet train system from point a to point b let's say from north india to south india if the various states in the way refuse to cooperate then the the entire project is never going to take off and then you have the judiciary that has that sings to that sings its own tune and so on so there are so many things that prevent the central government from doing things that it wants to do and power is not influence influence is not power <laughs> i would not agree with that so you know it's like that see what is influence and what is power the diff- there is a very significant difference let's say you are a celebrity and you have 10 million followers on instagram and these people 10 million people they will listen to what you say because they're interested in what you have to say that is called influence now let's consider another scenario you have 100 well trained heavily armed men at your disposal who will immediately obey you without question that is power the other thing is influence power is more valuable so that is the situation that we are in today uh, democracy is kind of overrated it doesn't give you the power that you need to the extent that we believe it is all right sir so thank you for the question nice meeting you grish okay let us bring in abhishek hello namaste sir namaste abhishek where are you from Sir, Asan Solvesh Bengal. Asan Solvesh Bengal. All right, sir. What's your question? Sir, can you tell me about how US is losing its hegemony over around the globe and how is it in a declining position? Mm-hmm. Yes, good question, Abhishek. Thank you. Uh, let me answer the question. So, the US hegemony is being lost because it is losing. It's a good question. How did this happen? So, power and leadership are closely interrelated when you have good leaders you got to be powerful when you have leaders who lack vision or who are not vigorous or who are a little bit feeble so to say then you will lose power and if you have a succession of such leaders who are good at talking but not good at good at uh, taking action then your country over time will lose its power now what is the power the us is losing first of all the chinese influence is rising when you have a very big economy you're going to have a correspondingly bigger footprint in terms of power projection your military will be will be larger you will be able to control the global systems and all that so that is what has given rise to american power firstly they are the largest economy in the world they control the economic systems of the world the supply chains uh the global uh, institutions economic institutions like the world bank the imf etc their currency is the global reserve currency so that these are the manifestations of, of american power and control over the world now the chinese influence is rising they have infiltrated the U, united united nations the who their currency is gaining in strength lots of countries are accepting the chinese currency uh, in in uh, economic transactions so that is causing the american power to get to to become weaker then they had a military presence all across the world now they have abdicated it to some extent in eurasia they have evacuated from afghanistan they no longer have a position a presence there they no longer have a presence in central asia like they used to have and so on so you can see the visible decline they, they their geographical footprint is declining their economic power is declining the chinese power is rising the chinese economy is rising the chinese military strength is also rising the naval strength is rising the american strength is the same so if you look at the comparative trajectory of the graph the chinese graph is rising the american graph is stagnating so that's how we know that overall american influence and power in the world is waning and as you can see if you look at american society american society is in chaos there is so much division and strife in american society today the so called american exceptionalism is not to be seen anywhere it has been replaced by this mediocrity the woke culture so america is not producing great leaders anymore so overall 
the country is visibly in decline. So that's why people all over the world are saying that American power is declining now. Okay, Abhishek. So that's what I can say. Good question. Nice meeting you. Okay. Who else is waiting? Lots of people are waiting. Let's bring in Kanav. <clears throat> Hello. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Where are you from? Sir, I am from Himachal Pradesh. Nice to meet you, sir. Yeah. What's your question? Sir, my question is that, uh, coming back to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, my question is that mm -hmm. what US exactly wants? Like, US is expanding its NATO, despite the fact that for what it was made back in 1949, it has already expired. So I want to know that why is US continuing the uh, the dead cold war till now? What's the main motto of it? Is the, Does US want to make a lucrative market of it? Is US making money out of it? Or there is something else? as reason related to it. I want to know that what US exactly wants in NATO perspective. Ex very good question. Very good question. Short and, and brief and precise. Good. Let me answer that. So what is the objective of NATO and what does the US want? Very good question. That goes to the heart of the entire matter. The US has always wanted global hegemony, world domination. There should be no power on the planet that can challenge the United States. They, don't, they will not tolerate a large nation or a powerful nation anywhere in the world as far as they can. If they can, they will destroy all countries. That is what's known as, this, as the secretive blitzer doctrine. Okay, so that's what it is. So they will, they even after the USSR broke up, we still have this very big country called Russia. Right? So for some time, they were able to influence Russia. There was this guy called Boris Yeltsin, who was essentially a US agent. And what Boris Yeltsin did was he systematically and deliberately destroyed the Russian economy. So in, when the USSR was in place, it was a collectivized society. It was a communist country, which means that all the property, all the wealth was collectivized and it was, it was, uh, it was in the custody of the government. The wealth belonged to the people, to the nation, but its custodian was the government and the government would decide what it would be used for. So all that wealth belonged to the people and it was in the custody of the, of the USSR's government. After the USSR broke up and the Russian government came to power under Boris Yeltsin, what he did was he, he took all this money and he gave it away as gifts to various oligarchs these so-called businessmen who, who were in his favor. So all of this money that belonged to the people of Russia, he gave it away as gifts to a number of businessmen, oligarchs. And that's what gave rise to these very powerful oligarchs that we have in Russia today. So all the wealth was stolen. And then what these oligarchs did was they were given the task of running businesses that would fail. So all of the wealth of the USSR was frittered away and the Russian economy went into a shambles. There was very high inflation and Russia became almost like a failed country until Vladimir Putin came into the picture. And then he arrested the fall and then, then slowly over time, over the last 20 years, he has kind of rebuilt the economy to a certain extent and Russia is reasonably stable today. So Boris Yeltsin was essentially a US agent. He presided over the destruction of the Russian economy. Before him, you had Mikhail Gorbachev who, who broke the USSR itself. So the US, even after the USSR broke up, wanted to further destroy Russia. And that was the purpose of NATO after the dissolution of the USSR. So NATO was built, was created as a counterweight to the USSR. After the USSR broke up, NATO started expanding eastwards by, even though the promise was made, it would not do so. And its aim was to encircle Russia and prevent Russia from exerting any kind of geopolitical influence in the countries it used to uh, have influence over in the past. So the overall objective was to destroy the strength of the of the Russian nation and to, to uh, ensure that it is never a threat in the future to the US. So that was the objective. And that's always been the objective uh, the world over when it comes to US foreign policy. And the same goes for India. They don't want India to rise. They did not want China to rise. They made a very, very big mistake. In uh, They miscalculated 
what the Chinese would be like. They thought they would be able to influence China once China was integrated into the global economy, into the US-led global economy. Once China became a capitalist country, they, they assumed that China would again become democratic also, which never happened. So they made a huge blunder there. So that's uh, how it has been. So the objective of NATO is to has been to destroy the USSR first and then Russia. But now it has, uh, it has reached a very big roadblock. All right. So that's the answer, sir. Very good question. And thank you for the question. Nice meeting you. Okay, let us bring in um, Urmil. Urmil. Hello. Hello, sir. Hi, nice to meet you, sir. Where are you from? So I'm in the US right now. Okay, what's your question, sir? So like you predicted and uh, some of your guests in your podcast predicted that India is facing an imminent threat from China in the near future. So how does India need to prepare it in terms of diplomatic perspective or should we go in terms of military perspective saying, looking, keeping in the mind that we won't get enough support from maybe Russia and US as of now with our stand with which we have in terms of the current crisis? Good question, sir. Let me answer that now. So, uh, yes, it is believed, it is it is being anticipated that India and China may May, may be engaged in some kind of conflict in the in the forthcoming future, definitely before 2024. That is what is being expected. So what does India need to do to prepare for this? Is there a diplomatic solution? When somebody attacks you militarily, there is no diplomatic solution. If the conflict happens, it will not be started by India. Because India is does not want to have any kind of military conflict. India is right now, it's only ambition is to grow its economy so when you're trying to grow your your economy you don't you don't want to enter into any kind of military conflict with anybody so if a conflict with with china happens it's going to be started initiated by the chinese a military conflict and as you li- rightly said nobody is going to come and help india not the us the us doesn't want to help india and the russians are not in a position to help india because they need the chinese on their side so if a conflict happens india is on its own so what does india need to do to prepare for this. India needs to be aware that something like this can happen. India needs to ensure it has the right amount of missiles, cruise missiles ready, BrahMos missiles, hopefully the other one, the other cruise missile which we have, what's it called? Nirbhay, I think. And India needs to keep an eye on the Chinese deployments in Chinese-occupied Tibet. We should, we have satellites and all that, so we know what's happening. So we need to monitor this on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. To know what the Chinese are up to. Of course, it's not as easy as I make it sound right now. Things are difficult because the terrain is very mountainous. It's the Himalayas. But we need to be prepared. We need to know how many fighter planes are deployed in Tibet, how many Chinese fighter planes are there, what are the movements and so on and so forth. So if something happens, we'll be aware of it. We should be able to anticipate that something is happening, something is coming right now. Our military strength is reasonably good. And of course, we have the Brahmastra, which tells the Chinese that you there is a certain line you simply cannot cross. And if you cross that, you're going to pay the price for it. So we have that. So the Chinese objective is not going to be to come and invade India and occupy India. It will be to humiliate India. That will be their limited objective. So for instance, by uh, taking a big bite out of Indian territory, maybe in the Northeast, or maybe by cutting off the Northeast at the chicken's neck, these may be the objectives. And they would be hoping that if India, if India is humiliated like that, then in the next elections, the government will fall and a more and a government they like will come to power. So that could be the objective. So India needs to be prepared. Our military strength is reasonably good. I don't think the Chinese, if we are well prepared, then I don't think the, think the Chinese will be able to succeed in such a misadventure. They may actually have to be, pay a big price for that. So India needs to be aware, simply, that such a thing can happen in the forthcoming days. And India needs to keep monitoring the situation in Chinese occupied Tibet day by day, hour by hour. And then we will be in a good position to deal with this. But one thing we should be aware of is that nobody is going to come and help us. So we will have to take this on our own. All right, Urmil, thank you for the question. Nice meeting you. Thank Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. Let's bring in Shazin. Shazin. Hello. Hello. Can I be heard? Hi. Yes, I can hear you, ma'am. Oh. Where are you from? 
I'm um, I'm originally from Bangladesh, but I live in Canada. Um, okay, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, so I've been um, I've been following you for the last like half a year or so. That's how I was introduced to you. So I'm, I'm I find you super knowledgeable and very like informative when it comes to like geopolitics. Um, Thank you. So my question is is that um, if let's say if India and China were to get into like a ruffle or or some sort of like conflict, um, where do you think like uh, countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, like smaller countries within within the SARC Federation, where do you think that they would stand and how do you think um, they would prepare for that type of uh, invasion or conflict? Good question. I'm going to answer it now. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Yes. So if India and China enter into a military conflict, what will be the position or the role of countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, maybe Pakistan, etc. So let's not let's not talk about Pakistan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. These are countries that are very much part of the Indian Ocean and Indian subcontinent region. I would expect that Bangladesh and Sri Lanka would try and be neutral as far as possible in such a conflict because they don't want to get involved in this and dragged into this. And there is no need for Bangladesh or Sri Lanka to get involved in this. If there is a conflict between India and China, a short war or something, it is definitely going to be initiated by China and they will try and they, their objective will be to take a bite out of Indian territory, maybe cut off the northeast uh, northeastern part of India and try to humiliate India and ensure that the government falls in the next election. So that's going to be the limited objective. And then when a, when a different government comes to power, one, one that is a weaker government, maybe a coalition government, more pliable for China, then they will try to drag India into their Chinese financial and geopolitical orbit. So that would be the big picture objective of the Chinese if they were, were to initiate a military conflict with India. It will be a short, sharp war, not a long, protracted war. In such a case, I don't expect a country like Bangladesh or a country like Sri Lanka to even get involved in any way at all. If it's a week-long or two-week-long long conflict, there's no need for these countries to get involved. And it would be best for a country like Bangladesh or Sri Lanka to stay out of this because uh, when two elephants or giants are fighting, a smaller animal doesn't want to be part of that. So I don't expect Bangladesh or Sri Lanka to get to... to be involved to any extent in this. On the other hand, if the Chinese capture Taiwan, then countries like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh may become targets or they may be wooed by the Chinese because the Chinese have, a, have this policy called the string of pearls policy of encircling India at sea. If they become, uh, if they succeed in taking Taiwan, then they'll become a major power in the Indo-Pacific region. And then countries like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh would be very happy to offer their services, ports and facilities to China so as to stay on the good side of China. So in case the Chinese take, take Taiwan, then the situation changes. But if it's a conflict between China and India, most likely Sri Lanka and, and Bangladesh will stay neutral and stay out of it. So that's how I see it going if this happens. So Shazin, very good question and nice meeting you. Okay, let's take maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Let's bring in Mr. Rishikesh. Rishikesh. Hello. Hi. 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 I'm from Vishakhapatnam. So where are you from, sir? I'm from Vishakhapatnam. Oh, I was nice in the show about a month ago. I asked a question back then, too. Yeah, I, I kind of re remember you. Yes, right. <laughs> I'm glad you could. <laughs> yeah. So currently, we are aware that um, the Asia Pacific is a hot spot for, you know, initiation of a global conflict in the long run mm -hmm. and um, Navy will have a significant part in it. But uh, I remember that uh, you once clarified that the Japanese Navy po possesses like more strength than the Indian Navy and they are a more significant threat to the Chinese than the Indian should be because we are their, you know, direct, direct uh, opponents right now. So how come Japanese Navy poses more threat to the Chinese than the Indian Navy while we have a larger budget and uh, more people in our country? Good question, sir. Good question. Yeah, let me answer that. So like Rishikesh said, the Japanese Navy is more powerful than, than the Indian Navy. It is more potent. And why is it so? So firstly, 
how do you determine the strength of a navy typically most people would imagine is that what most people would imagine is that if you have more ships you are a more powerful navy but that is not the case the actual strength of a navy is determined by the number of of anti ship missiles you can deploy at sea on a given day so the japanese i believe they can deploy on any given day approximately 1500 anti ship missiles offensive missiles that's a whole lot of missiles uh india cannot deploy anything like that number of missiles so that's why the japanese navy is way more powerful than the indian navy and secondly their submarines are some of the best submarines in the world very very uh high very good technology very silent submarines and very powerful submarines in, in terms of offensive ability even the submarines they have retired are better than the submarines we have right now right so so it's so why is it like this or such a small country has a better navy than us because they are in a, almost like an economic superpower their naval budget is greater than india's naval budget and their technology is far superior than any technology we have developed in the in the past decades because essentially we have not been developing any technology at all we have simply been purchasing purchasing weapons from other countries whether it's submarines whether it's, it's anything else air force whatever so that is why the japanese navy is way more advanced and way, way more technologically advanced and way more powerful than the indian navy and also because they have they are able to deploy way more missiles than us so it's about offensive missiles it's not about defensive missiles there are certain missiles that can, that are anti missile missiles like the barak 8 missile that india has so th- that's how it is so the japanese have more they have better warships they have more warships i believe and they they have better submarines and overall they they just have a better navy and their naval budget is greater than india's naval budget as far as i know i haven't uh, compared the figures recently but they, they they are a huge economy right so so that's the reason why it is the way it is all right so i hope i have answered the question rishikesh very interesting question nice meeting you sir thank you bye okay let us take let's take one more question uh and okay future leader something okay hello sir okay hello good evening sir uh, sir i'm from good evening uh, sir delhi. good evening delhi all right uh, uh, sir uh, so so my question is that uh, isn't uh, zelensky using it citizen as uh, hostages since he said that uh, pe- people between the age of 18 to 60 can't uh, leave ukraine and and using patriotism and media uh to show them as uh on the good side but actually he's holding holding them as hostages and since russian forces will be forced to kill the armed civilians and then they will use this propaganda against russia that see they are killing uh, civilians russian forces are killing civilians over here yes sir good question uh let me answer that so like you said you are right the they are certainly using foreign nationals as human shields as hostages they they are holding indians and africans and various uh, people from other nationalities mainly students but also like you said they are trying to forcibly conscript civilians into the armed forces uh, there are videos circulating on social media of the various battalions paramilitary paramilitary military forces militias stopping cars on the streets dragging people out and forcing them to to join the the conflict giving weapons and all that so yes this is extremely unethical and if you if you put ak47s and automatic rifles in the in the hands of civilians then the opposition force the russians will be compelled to treat those people as enemy combatants and that's going to create unnecessary completely completely avoidable civilian casualties so that's a very cynical and diabolical approach the zelensky government has taken maybe they are being told to do so from by their masters living another uh, sitting in another country maybe that's the, that's the case and this all goes into the propaganda warfare the more civilian deaths you have the the, the worse the russians look so it's all about making the russians look bad that's just terrible because you are using humans as cannon fodder innocent civilians but that's indeed what's happening and it's it's very very sad i mean war is tragic as it is and if you get civilians involved in that it's even worse so yes that is unfortunately what's happening but that's the the, the nature of warfare 
you have all kinds of avoidable and pointless atrocities and deaths and loss of life and it's the civilians always the innocent civilians who suffer the most anyhow yeah that's a good question thank you for the question sir okay uh, let's let's bring in one final person anubhav hello hello sir so i am from <laughs> i sir i am from kolkata and my question is is there any player or any warmonger who is trying to stress the war more is there anybody who is trying to stretch the more wo- the war yes, more sir. make it longer. yes sir oh, okay okay got the got the question thank you for the question is there any person who is trying to lengthen the war uh yes i i think it is the ukrainian government <laughs> which is trying to delay the russian advance by putting civilians where they should not be when the russians are advancing if you put you civilians in the military installations as, as human shields then the russians will be forced to slow down the progress because they they have been told to ensure there are as few civilian casualties as possible and again the russians are under instructions to ensure there are no indian deaths as far as possible and if the zelensky government is putting indians in harm's way holding them hostages and putting them uh, and forcing them to be in military install- installations then the russians will have to be extremely careful not to cause deaths of indians so yes these are ways in which you can delay the progress of the war and uh, make sure there are more civilian casualties and make the other side look bad so yes that's indeed what's happening right so yeah that's the answer thank you anubhav nice meeting you uh should i take one more question okay let me take one more question by shashank hello hello sir how are you i am very well sir how are you doing where are you from yes sir i am from hyderabad sir nice to meet you um, what's your question it's been a great pleasure meeting you uh nice sir actually i have a doubt that hmm? uh, is putin trying to reunion like uh, he is trying to reunite uh, the soviet union by invading one uh, one country after the another like he started with ukraine now he, can he go with other countries the remaining 15 countries for his fatherland some like a nazi ideology what putin okay. actually wants yes sir okay good question sir so one country after another has not happened he is going for ukraine right now and the reason for that is because ukraine was trying to join nato and that would be a red line that he cannot allow them to cross because then you will have the american forces and nato forces forces right on his doorstep so that is the reason why he did that he is not in a position to go and start invading country after country he is not in that position he is not a madman so even if he may be harboring ambitions of recreating the ussr we don't know what's going on mr in mr putin's head we are not privy to his private personal thoughts so we don't know but uh he is not crazy he is a very rational person so he is simply trying to effect a regime change in ukraine he may not even try to take over the entire country he may leave one third of the country out of his uh, dominion by the time the the invasion is completed so that's what we can see right now as far as what is going on in his mind does he plan to invade one country after another i don't think so he is not crazy like adolf hitler was he is not mad and that greedy and he knows what his limitations are he is under incredible sanctions right now and he has to do i mean he he has to ensure that he is not going on the bad side of china if he starts acting like adolf hitler then the chinese will not be in a position to support him anymore so there is a delicate balancing game that's being played and all he is trying to do is to counterbalance nato and ensure that nato doesn't move eastwards any further because that would be a mortal deadly threat to his country so that is what he is doing i do not think he is going to start invading country after country and even if he wants to he is not in a position to do that and the chinese will not support such an action all right so that's the answer and that brings us to the end of today's session i know there are lots of people waiting i apologize to all of you who have entered but the, this is the end of today's session thank you so much for to everybody 
for your questions. Thank you for all the viewers and all the support. And let's keep doing this. So I will see you all in the next episode. Thank you very much. Take care.